All right, greetings everyone. We are just gonna give everyone who was in the waiting room a chance to log on. Let's see. Um, and we're admitting. Okay, great. Well, good afternoon. We are so excited to spend this time with you. Welcome everyone in the MS Delta area. We today are honored to have some charities among us and we are so delighted that you decided to spend this lunch and learn with us. And so my name is Melanie. For those of you who don't know me, I am the outreach coordinator, at least one of the outreach coordinators for our Mississippi Delta zone. My role is to support, assist, and I'm always there in the background cheering you on. So we are excited about today's lunch and learn Welcome to everyone. We have a few housekeeping rules that we're going to start with. And um, while I'm doing that, if you would take a second and just type your name into the chat feature. For those of you who have, this is your first time on ZoomGov, you can just hover along at your, I don't know where your toolbar may be, but click on chat and type in your name and your agency along with your state since we actually span over six states. We want to know who you are and what state you're from. This is also going to help enter you into our $20 drawing. You know that everyone who attends at least one or more of our Lunch and Learns at the very end of our last Lunch and Learn on December 10th, we will be doing a drawing for a $20 gift certificate and so or gift card. So you definitely want to be a part of that. So start adding that into our chat feature. And a little bit more that we found with these lunch and learns to help you to enjoy it in the, you know, the best way possible. If you click on gallery view and you also want to hover over any non video participants. So right now everyone's video who's not part of our panelists should be turned off and you can hover over any squares of people who are not having the, who don't have their video currently on. And if you hover over there, then you can click on hide non-video participants and then you'll only see seven boxes. You should just see seven video boxes. And if you click on gallery view, then you can see everyone at once. It just makes a, a better uh, experience for the lunch and learn. And I think everybody else is already on mute. So great job. And we see some information popping into our chat. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Excellent. Again, I'm Melanie. I am a, being assisted today by my partner, Pamela. Pamela, give him a wave. <laughs> Good afternoon. Pamela will be typing information into the, the chat room, the questions that we ask our panelists. And um, towards the end, before we, before we dismiss, we will hopefully have some time to share some of your questions or ask some of your questions to our panelists. Today's topic is one that's near and dear to my heart, so I'm excited about getting started. But before I do, I just want to talk a little bit about why we're here. We know that it is the combined federal campaign season, and <clears throat> combined federal campaign has been around for almost 60 years. It is the federal agency's one and only largest time of giving. And so the reason that you all are here to hear from our charities today and in the 60, near 60 years of having the CFC, we've raised over almost eight and a half billion dollars. So your collective dollars are making a huge impact and more than any, ever year, any other year ever, probably this year, our charities need it, especially our charities on the front line need your donations more than in any other year. So thank you again for your time here. Uh, our topic today is health and well-being. And just a few little tidbits for you. At least half of the world's population does not have access to basic health care. More than 16,000 children under the age of five die every day, and many of those are from preventable causes. Six, in, six out of 10 adults in the U.S. have chronic diseases. Four out of 10 of those have more than one. And so heart disease and cancer are two leading causes of death 
in uh, American adults. So I could go on and on with the, the information, but I think now is the, the best time to hear from those who are on our panelists. And so I'm going to, or who are on our panel, excuse me. So I'm going to read to you the panelists names and the organizations that they are from. You will notice that their CFC numbers are in the corner of their names. And so that makes it more easy for you to identify them. And we first have Deb McCarthy from the Neurofibromatosis Network. You'll be hearing from her in just a second. So I'm gonna read all of the panelists' names first and then we'll give them a second to introduce themselves. We have John O'Brien today from the American Kidney Fund. We have Cynthia Osfeld from A Child's Wish. We have Ruth Ann Allen, who is from the Ronald McDonald House Charities of Mississippi Incorporated. And we have Darren Thomas, who's joined by, who's joined with uh, Natalie Jones today from Porter Leap. And so welcome to all of our guests today. We are again excited. And I'm just gonna kind of go around and give you all just uh, one or two minutes to introduce yourselves. And some may have a video to share during their introduction. So John, we're gonna start with you. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure, thanks, uh, Melanie. Thanks everybody for attending. Um, uh, my name is John O'Brien. I'm with the American Kidney Fund. Um, we are excited to be here to be part of the CFC uh, campaign um, with all these other charities. Uh, again, um, I encourage everyone to, again, follow your hearts uh, and choose a charity that's, that's near and dear to you. Um, I've been with the American Kidney Fund for a little over two years. Um, I'll just start with the problem and then we'll talk about uh, the solution that at least as an organization we try to what we're trying to do to uh to fix this problem uh so kidney disease um for, for some of you who might not know is the ninth leading cause of death in the united states uh 37 million americans uh have kidney disease and the scary thing about kidney disease is that it's it's silent um there's no there, there are no symptoms unfortunately until you go to the doctor having problems and you realize you have a problem and then you crash into dialysis. And one of the things that we um, as an organization try to do is to come up with, so what's the fix for this? How do we help people um, uh, with, this, with this disease again, which is the ninth leading cause of death in the United States? Well, one, we have education programs. Um, we have, um, which helps individuals with their diet uh, with screenings, uh, we have webinars because the more you know ahead of time, the better are the better you are um, at preventing uh, uh, coming down with with kidney disease. We do know that the two main causes for kidney disease is high blood pressure and diabetes, and so we try to get that word out to everyone um, during our screening process. Um, we do also know that with kidney disease, there's a lot of things that people can and can't do. One, a lot of the time if you're going through dialysis, you can't work full time. So you're limiting yourself to either part-time work or no work at all because you have to go into dialysis. And so we try to help low income dialysis patients uh, with their health insurance premiums. Um, we have a safety net program that we help with out-of-pocket expenses um, that patients could apply for. Uh, and use these monies for food, uh, transportation, uh, and medicines. Um, and, and we also help during disasters, either hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, that may displace uh, folks that are on dialysis to relocate them so they can continue their dialysis. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, <laughs> we'll my time. Great. Yeah, well, well, we'll hear more from you in a little while, John, but thank you I'm for sorry. that introduction. <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna to go to Cynthia, but before Cynthia starts speaking, for those who are just joining us, please make sure that you type your name into the chat room, your name and your agency, as well as the state that you're from, so that we can add you to our drawing and so we can know that, that who's here in the house today. Also, if our panelists are saying things and you think of a question that you'd like to ask one of our panelists, please type it in the chat room and hopefully before the end of this session, we'll have time to ask. So go ahead, Cynthia. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us. We're just delighted to be here and, and appreciate the opportunity to reach a large number of people. I'm with an organization called A Child's Wish. We are, as you would suspect, a wish granting organization, and we've been doing it since the early 80s. The, the most unique thing about our group is that we are all volunteer. And we have been doing it as a volunteer agency since the 80s. And we do everything from raise the money to things like I'm doing right now to facilitating the wishes of, you know, a, a child battling cancer has a birthday party in Thibodeau in December in the freezing rain. We have members that have gone out and assembled a swing set as his wish for, you know, for his birthday party that day. And, and I mean, we've had, we've taken children to meet the Pope when he came to New Orleans. We've, we've done it all. Most, most really want to go to Disney. And as you can, can imagine right now, it's a little challenge. We have eight or nine wishes in the queue right now waiting for you know, the, the Give Kids the World, the accommodations at Disney for children like we have to open back up and, um, you know, for their health to stabilize so they can do these things. But um, it's just been an, an incredibly enriching experience to be part of the group. And, um, you know, we appreciate the, the opportunity to share our stories and the stories of our marvelous children and their very, very inspiring parents who, who never complain. They never complain about anything. They, you know, uh, every time I, I go and meet wish people and, and or would go to the hospital and get the paperwork signed by the doctors and whatnot, I'm, I always have that takeaway. They, they don't complain. And I go home and I tell my family, we have no problems. We have no problems. So um, we, you know, I'd like to share a little bit of a video and let you guys see a little bit more about what we do. So hopefully I do this right. Share my screen. Okay, share. And then I'm going to play. A dream bedroom, a day as a fashion model, a trip to Disney. For more than 35 years, A Child's Wish of Louisiana has been helping families going through so much make memories they'll treasure forever. The mission of A Child's Wish is to grant wishes to children who suffer from life-threatening illness. We are the wish granters. This organization is absolutely true to its roots and never ever fails to spend every dime that they raise for the kids. A Child's Wish is different than a lot of organizations because it's all volunteer. There are no paid staff. Everyone we meet adopts and buys into the importance doing something special for children. We've done some pretty amazing and really fun things over the years. Do you know a child who needs a fairy godmother? We have the magic wand. Let's make wishes come true. Thank you all for giving me the opportunity and uh, I, I will yield my time, thanks. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, Ruth Ann. You have to unmute Ruth Ann. Yep. Let's see. Okay. Uh, she may have gotten a phone call or I'm not sure, but we're going to go to Deb real quick while we get Ruth Ann all straight. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you. This is Deb McCarthy from the Neurofibromatosis Network, and we are grateful to be here with the CFC Lunch and Learn session. Um, neurofibromatosis is a genetic disorder of the nervous system, which causes tumors to form on any nerve anywhere in the body at any time. Um, this progressive disorder affects all races, all ethnic groups, and both sexes equally. Uh, NF is one of the most common gen genetic disorders of the U.S., it affects about one in every 100 or 2,500 to 3,000 births. Uh, NF affects more than 1,000 or 100,000 Americans. This makes NF more prevalent than cystic fibrosis, hereditary muscular dystrophy, uh, Huntington's disease, and Tay Sachs combined. And I think the best way for me to better explain what NF is 
is by sharing a little video. When our daughter was diagnosed, we didn't know about neurofibromatosis. We had never even heard the word before. We actually heard the word neurofibromatosis for the first time back in 2009. My daughter, uh, Emma, was not even a year old. And as a dad who didn't hear this word neurofibromatosis until my daughter was being diagnosed with it, what do you do? I don't, I don't even know what that word means. We went to the library, because back then there was no internet, this was 30 years ago, and we read the information and it became quite frightening. And you do the one thing your doctor tells you not to, go Google it. And the images that come up on a Google search are of some of the more extreme cases and it scares you, it scares you a lot. But fortunately, after seeing pictures we probably didn't want to and reading things that were only possible in a small percentage of the people that have NF, we connected with NF Network. Uh, when I made that first phone call, the executive director herself picked up the phone and spoke to me not as the executive director of a national charity, but, but as a mom. Being able to express fear, frustration, to people that get it. Um, that matters. They're uh, people we call on when we have questions. They're people we lean on when things are hard and people who understand what it's like to have a child with NF. They truly guide me in all aspects of what's happening here in my personal life. It's really allowed me to become part of a community um, of people that, that understand. I was immediately brought into this community that uh, um, is now truly more than that to our family. It's, it's part of our family. Until there's a cure, we need the generous support of people like you to join with us and help provide support and education when the next NF family calls. Thank you for letting me share that. Thank you, thank you. Ruth Ann, are we, are we good? I wanna go back to you real quick. I don't know. Okay. Are we? Yes, we can hear oh, you. Oh, good. <laughs> Great. My audio always has a problem. So anyway, I'm Ruth Ann Allen with Ronald McDonald House Charities in Mississippi. And one of the things, or the thing we do is we keep families together during a child's medical crisis. If you can imagine the excitement of a couple who are expecting their first child and they've gone to their appointments and they get close to uh, delivery and the doctor says, I believe there's a problem with your infant. Um, so we're going to have to take your child to surgery as soon as that child is born or the child is born and um, there are complications, so that child is taken immediately to the neonatal intensive care unit. We also work with families who they've been through teenage years and they've let their kids go off, um, you know, with the car and they get that late night phone call and there's been an accident and that teenager's being uh, transferred to Jackson, Mississippi for specialized medical care. Um, of course, families drop everything and head to the hospital. Well, the hospital's taking care of the children and then that's where Ronald McDonald House Charities of Mississippi comes in. We take care of the families. We provide them with home-like lodging. We have meals available for them, whether they're you know, hot, home cooked, ready to eat, or whether they are food available in our kitchen. We serve up to 16 families each night. Hmm. Those families come from across the state of Mississippi and also uh, we have families across state lines in Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Alabama who come and stay with us. Those families stay with us as long as their child is in intensive care. 
Many times there is a mother who's here by herself and she will connect with another mother and they become friends. And that's truly what Ronald McDonald's house is about. Not only keeping that family together, but families who are the single moms, they form a family together. And our volunteers and staff, we're here to help them along the way in providing comfort and compassion uh, while they need it most. Great. Well, thank you very much, Ruthann. And Darren. Well, good afternoon. I've been saying good morning all day. I normally get my days and times of the day mixed up, so please forgive me, but good afternoon. So excited to be with you all. My name is Darren Thomas. You will see my colleague, Natalie Jones, momentarily, but we are representing Port Elise here in Memphis. I saw some folks drop in the chat that they're from Memphis, so hey, Memphis, I see you in the house, yeah. <laughs> wanted to talk a little bit about Port Elite. What is Port Elite? Who is Port Elite? Uh, I'll give you just a brief summary of what we do. Uh, founded in 1850 as an orphanage, it has since transformed into a six program and three initiative organization where we're serving over 50,000 children and families throughout Shelby County and as well as some families in DeSoto County, Mississippi. And what we really do here is a myriad of things. So you're looking at everything from early childhood education, that's for children six weeks to five years old, providing them with a unique academic experience where they can actually learn how to do everything from count their one, two, threes and do their ABCs to actually learn what is it to like to be nutritional? What, what does that mean for a child? What does that look like? Uh, we're doing early childhood literacy, where we're providing books into the homes of over 40,000 children and families at no cost to those children and their families. We are providing pre and postnatal care for uh, expecting mothers and fathers. We are doing foster care and intergenerational youth residential therapy. We are providing an experience for seniors who have retired to have access to helping provide some enrichment into our classrooms. And we are also doing some early childhood education professional development. So we're doing a bunch of different things for a bunch of different children and families. But most of all, what we're trying to do is empower children and families to achieve a healthy, optimal, and independent lifestyle. Because I'm a preacher, I know that my two minutes has come and gone, so I will stop it right now. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, everyone. We are really excited again and honored that all of you are here today. And so for those who joined us a little bit later, all of our charities have their charity CFC code listed in their um, little box with their name. So please make sure that you're showing some love to our charities. We're going to go ahead and get started with our first question. <clears throat> And I'm going to ask this first question to all of our panelists. What impacts outside of COVID-19, the, the COVID-19 virus itself, has COVID had on the overall health and mental health of our communities? And I'm going to read that again. So what impacts outside of the COVID-19 virus itself has COVID-19 had on the overall health and the mental health of our communities? And I am going to go ahead and start this time with Cynthia. Okay, well, I can tell you that, you know, we have, we, our families go through so much anxiety and, you know, in some cases, a lot of despair, given the diagnosis they, they hear with their children. But I think, you know, it, it's probably increased that to a large degree. I know we've had one grandmother that we, we reach out and touch base with every month. And just to make sure that it, the child doesn't wanna do something right now instead of Disney that we could do, we could actually make happen for the child. And, and um, you know, the grandmother says every month, I'm not, doing, I'm not letting her do anything until the world is back to normal. Mm -hmm. So we just, um, we say, okay, you know, we're, we're ready and waiting when, when you are. So that's been kind of a, 
you know, our experience so far, but I, I definitely think the anxiety levels have, have gone to a new level. So. Yeah. Understood. John, share with us. Yeah, I think, you know, a, a lot of people I think are going through some of the same things with isolation and things like that. But I think for our uh, constituents, uh, kidney patients and those on, on dialysis, um, you know, they're at higher risk because they're already immunocompromised. Because when you when you receive a new kidney, the first thing they want to do is to stop your body from fighting off that new organ. And so they intentionally downgrade your ability to fight diseases. Um, and so that makes this this you know this group a little more vulnerable, especially during uh, during this time. Uh, they can't really stay home because they have to go to dialysis, and so that also increases the risk of being out more than than we are in, you know, in terms of being you know locked down and things like that. They don't have that option unless you're doing home dialysis. So you actually have to go out, and um, so that that causes a problem for most. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Ruth Ann, what have you experienced? I agree with um, heightened levels of anxiety. Um, families are already in a stressful situation with their children being in intensive care or receiving specialized treatment. And the added anxiety of having uh, other children at home mm. who are, they're having to figure out how they're going to go to school or um, stay with someone, um, and then that's an added uh, burden when, um, you know, they're trying to figure out who's going to care for those children at home and try to be um, with their children in the hospital, too. Mm. We've tried to adjust our, um, you know, our services to try to incorporate uh, and lessen that anxiety, but I definitely believe anxiety is um, increased tremendously. Thank you. Deb, what have you found? Well, it's really interesting because it seems as though our community, the NF community, is experiencing similar things to what Ruth Ann and John have mentioned. Um, you know, because of the side effects of NF, a fair number of the individuals, besides having internal tumor growth, they've got the external tumor growth, which of course, um, makes them feel uncomfortable out in public. So they do have a tendency to stay isolated. And we have events where we bring the NF community together um, to help them form a community. So they feel like they're with the same, you know, you know, with other people that have got similar issues. But because of COVID, you know, we have, we've come to a screeching halt as far as any of our in-person activities. And um, that, that is isolating them that much more. And then that of course causes anxiety and depression. And, you know, they can't see their NF specialists because the majority of them have to see specialists and anybody, anybody that had that were delayed to begin with because of the specialist of seeing a specialist that might be out six months. Well, it's just gotten pushed back again and again and again. And um, so it's just the tough, weakened communication between the NF specialists and the individuals. And then the, the isolation is just difficult. No doubt. Darren. So I, I would say that for us, with in really in particular in Shelby County, Tennessee, our COVID numbers are out of this world ridiculous. But what really has happened for us, in particular at Port Elite, is what I call limited access to help and limited access to hope. And what that really means is limited access to help is when our children come into our sites, they get an opportunity to have a nutritional experience where they get breakfast, lunch, and a snack. We're serving primarily low income families. And with those families, access to food is hard to come by when you have a lot of food deserts. And so we've now switched to a more virtual format which limits the chance for us to really connect with families to make sure that those children are gaining access to those breakfast, lunch, and snacks 
that are healthy and nutritional. And when it comes to hope, coming from a low income community, both knowing from experience as well as what I see from our children and families, they are coming into our classrooms and our sites, seeing these bright lights, seeing the energy of the teachers. But when they go home, sometimes they don't have that access because maybe their parents are not home. Maybe they don't have access or the funds to have lights at their actual home. And so now there's this limited access to hope because now what was, I was departing my sort of hopeless situation at home to come to a hope-filled place like my classroom has now been stripped from them due to the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. So well, don't, don't mute yourself, Darren, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with you on this next question. Hearing what everyone has just said, how has your organization had to adapt to meet those challenges of this, this past year or this year that we're currently in? All right. Well, hi, I'm Natalie Jones. I'm going to take this one for Darren. Um, so since everyone, uh, since about March, you know, we went, uh, everyone went home and everything was kind of postponed. But so since then, our classrooms have continued to teach virtually. All of our teachers, if you can imagine, are teaching preschool online, which is an incredibly challenging thing. Um, but they have created resources for parents. We've made sure that everyone has access to a device and um, a mobile hotspot. But the teachers are creating weekly videos with tips and tricks on how to, how to supplement what your child is learning virtually at home. And also we have been able to provide some families when they, um, when they are food insecure, we've been able to provide them with the food that they need and the resources to access more nutrition care um, and all of that. We've also done giveaways for PPE and school supplies. And I think the biggest thing as far as during the pandemic is that we have a 24 hour facility that we still <laughs> operate. So they have been operating continuously through this pandemic because even though we've all had to be at home, home isn't always the safest place for some children. And so they still need to get that mental health care that they need to be able to return safely to their home or to find a safer home for them. Um, so those people have been working absolutely nonstop, which is one of the hardest working people I've ever met in my life. But Well, thank you, Darren and, and Natalie. I just want to remind you that they are from Porter Leaf and I want to toss this question now to Ruth Ann, who's from the Ronald McDonald House Charities of Mississippi. How have you had to adapt? In a communal space uh, that we still try to make home-like, um, of course, we've increased our cleaning, and that means not only uh, with the staff that we have, but having to bring in professional cleaning and disinfecting um, We've had volunteers who have made masks uh, for us. Um, and then of course had to you know, purchase items and that type thing. But one of the biggest changes that we've had to do is reduce the number of families that we are able to serve so we can maintain the social distancing within a communal environment. Um, the first thing that we don't want to do is get a family sick uh, because they've been around other families. So that is our top priority, um, making sure that all of the families who reside with us, um, you know, remain healthy so they can continue to go and visit their children in the hospital. So it's really been adapting, um, you know, our facility to, to maintain that, that healthy environment. Thank you, understood. John, share with us um, what your experience has been. And just a reminder, John is from the American Kidney Fund. Uh, yeah, so thank you. So um, <clears throat> now the American Kidney Fund, I mean, our, we're a national organization and I wanted to just kind of put out a couple of numbers and how we impact the um, uh, patients in Mississippi. Uh, in 2019, we provided over $6 million uh, in financial assistance to, uh, for grants to over 1,800 uh, kidney patients in Mississippi. 
Um, and in terms of kind of switching and looking at how we had to change some of the things that we're doing, uh, we actually had to shift and create a coronavirus emergency fund uh, specifically for patients uh, to help them with transportation needs, medication, uh, and food. Um, we actually provided um, a coronavirus emergency grant um, to 162 patients in Mississippi um, in the amount of $40,000. And so we're, we're, we're supporting people you know, all over the United States, but I did want to point that out in terms of the immediate uh, impact we're having in this community. Um, but again, I mean, it's one of those things where in terms of shifting and we, like many of you, we've had galas, we've had golf events, all had to go virtual. So we had a virtual golf event, we had a virtual gala, and for some reason they all raised more than they did when they were actually in-person events. So I think that to me that says that our donors, um, our communities are, are coming together in this crisis. And so I think a lot of us can probably say the same thing uh, with those that, that have supported us and continue to stay with us during this time. All right, thank you. Okay, so Deb, share with us what your experience has been. And I just wanna remind you all that Deb is from the Neurofibromatosis Network. Um, one of the things that we've had to deal with is um, financially we've had to scale back because we cannot do in-person events and we cannot bring the um, NF community together and which of course impacts our fundraising efforts. Um, because of the reduction in staff we've had or because of the um, scale back we've had to do a reduction in staff, staff excuse me and let staff go. I mean, we were really already working on it with a skeleton crew. So that has, you know, put us back even more. What's, you know, also hindered us is we've had to stop sending out our uh, educational material to the NF community. And that is really important because the NF community, um, not all doctors even know what NF is. It's an incurable disease. And when they go to visit doctors that don't know what NF is, when they bring this NF material with them, that starts a path for that doctor to start reaching out to some of the NF specialists to give that person better NF care. So um, it, it's, it's, it's been tough. You know, we're making do, but it's been tough. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And Cynthia, Cynthia is from A Child's Wish. How have you had to adapt? Well, we've had, um, we've obviously not been able to send children to Disney, which is most, you know, most of the younger age bracket. That's really what they want to do. We've had to, you know, just we've offered alternative situations of like we did for a little girl right before um, we, we went on kind of a lockdown in Louisiana. We, we did a princess party for her. Her mom was about to have another baby and it was not safe for the family to travel. So we, we rented a place and we had characters come in costumes. We got photographers, we had you know, food catered and, and sweets and, and had a big party for, for them and the people they wanted to invite. But obviously now, even that might be a challenge to do. I don't think it would, you know, most people, because these children are all in treatment protocols right now that, that would render something like that very dangerous. And, you know, we had something really sad happen a couple of weeks ago. We had a young man who really wanted to go and hang out with some of the Pelicans players. And we tried our best to try and make that happen. And we just couldn't, I mean, the doctors were not, he was, he was just too sick and he passed away before we could mm. give him his wish. And it broke all of our hearts because there was just no real way to do it. You know, a Zoom would have been, you know, we tried to do something like that. He wanted to actually, meet people and be there and mm -hmm. you know and and we had reached out to the organization they were going to help us do that we've you know we've given kids we've put kids on the football field with the saints and put them in the locker room and we've done those types of things but but right now it's you know if we can't do something virtually even taking them shopping we've recreated a bedroom for a child who came out of chemo and really had to be isolated from her siblings and she'd never had her own room before so 
we went shopping and, and bought her all new furniture and bedding and, and we just created this little oasis for this little girl and she was just over the moon that she had her own bedroom and it was so fancy and, and but you just, we're just limited at this point. So we're uh, the Give Kids the World at Disney, which is the, um, the accommodations at within Disney and they have condos and, and hotels and stuff. And so we send the families there and, and they do the breakfast with the characters and they have a full medical team on site there too for, for safety precautions. And um, they've, what they've done, they've reached out to everybody like us and they've said, look, give us the names and addresses of your wish kids. We're going to send them a care package names and treats and all kinds of stuff so that's what we're doing right now but i think you know we have kids lined up ready to go as soon as we can hopefully get a vaccine i'm knocking on wood right now and and you know return the world to some normalcy i think we're gonna have quite a bumper crop so yep well i think i, I speak for everyone thank you not only for everything that you all are doing but for even making the the adjustments as we all have had to do in our lives but you all have to also do it now even with your charity so we appreciate that um, and we're making good time so I want to remind all of our viewers that if you do have a specific question that you want to ask one of our panelists please type it in a chat room and we may have a few minutes towards the end because we are uh, I'm going to ask this next question and then after that we'll, we'll open it up if we have some some chat room questions but our third question uh, it's similar, but what we want to know as CFC donors, what are ways that donors can make a difference uh, in health and, and well-being? What are, what are some of the ways that we can make a difference in, in health and well-being you know, as CFC donors? And so I, we're interested in hearing from everyone your take on this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead this time and start with you, Ruthann. I think as individuals, um, really just and humans in the world, um, I believe checking on each other um, is a real important thing. With regard to Ronald McDonald House, um, CFC donors, if there is an agency that wants to um, come together and uh, prepare a meal for families staying at Ronald McDonald House, you can do that socially distanced. Um, and then we have things in place, um, you know, to make sure that, you know, food is served safely and, and that type thing. Um, also, last year in 2019, the average donation that a family made um, when they stayed here was 63 cents per night. Um, definitely, it costs more to you know, provide that uh, facility for families to stay in. Um, so, you know, making those financial contributions um, so families can stay together. Um, but again, just within the, the COVID and um, even after COVID um, hopefully dissipates in our daily lives, um, continuing to, to check on each other. Um, and still connecting as a, um, as a human uh, to each other. Yeah. Thank you. Darren, you and Natalie have some feedback for us? Absolutely. So, uh, I, you know, one, personally, I piggyback off what Ruth Ann has said, which is really checking in on people, checking in on family, friends, associates, colleagues, whoever else. But then more than anything, check on yourself. Uh, one of the most powerful things that COVID really has, I hope, taught a number of people is to check individually on themselves to really see how am I doing? What, what is it that I need to be doing during this particular season? Now, as it relates to Port Elite, I put it very simply. It's as simple as A, B, C. Uh, a, act as an advocate. Uh, we need people out in the community, whether you are in New Orleans, or you're in Sunnyside, California, or even if you're in the great city known as the one and only Memphis, Tennessee. Act as an advocate. Tell people about the work of Port Leaf. Share with people about what you've heard today and the challenges that we have endured during this season. B, 
be a volunteer. I know that quite contrary to popular belief that COVID has eliminated volunteer opportunities. That is not the truth at Porter Lee. You can volunteer to be a virtual reader in our classrooms. Our children, yes, they are between six weeks and five years old, but they will bring all kinds of energy through the computer screen that will be transported onto you. Be a volunteer and connect with us as a volunteer. And then of course, the mo one of the great things that CFC donors can really do is also commit to contribute. Actually make a, yourself uh, available to commit to contribute to the work here at Porter Lee. We would love to have you as one of our great donors. We'd love to have you as one of our volunteers, but we would really love to have you as an advocate for the great work of Porter Lee. Thank you, Darren. Cynthia. Well, we would greatly appreciate, you know, of course, your good good wishes and thoughts and, and all that as we navigate through with this difficult time. But, you know, a, a contribution by you helps us provide the intangible of hope to these families that that's really all they have at this point. And in some cases, like with the young man we lost, you know, they they you want to give them that opportunity to create a memory that may have to sustain them throughout the rest of their lives because no one's guaranteed time and you know, we make advances every day in, in many of these horrible diseases that affect the kids we deal with. And, but, but we have no timetables. We have, we have no guarantees on what we can do and when we can do it. It's always, it's always a juggling act as to what we can, what wish we can fulfill and when we can do it because of considerations primarily to, to the health of the kids. And, um, you know, referrals too. I know Ronald McDonald in New Orleans has at times referred children to us and, and you know, social workers in the hospitals. And, and you know, we've, we've had some, the opportunity to serve the pub, you know, a greater public by recommendations or referrals from anybody in Louisiana who has a, a child that that would like the opportunity to to experience a wish. We would we would love to talk to them. So I um, appreciate the opportunity to to share this now. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Deb. Um. Well, we greatly appreciate the support of CFC donations uh, to the F NF network so we can continue being available for the NF community and be available for the next family that does call in for support. NF is a genetic disorder. You're born with it. There is no cure. So we get calls from infants, you know, new families that have an infant. We just had one that was a call from a family that has a six week old daughter with a micro deletion, which is a really severe case of NF. And we, two weeks ago, we got a call from a woman who was 43 years old, just diagnosed. She's had it all her life, but she was just, just diagnosed. She said, if I would have known that I had this, I had the learning disabilities, you know, and various other health issues that are associated with NF. Um, your donations help us be available, help us keep our doors open. We are a national organization with a very small staff and we you know, do everything we can to answer emails and phone calls to provide the NF specialist referrals to these families. And if we don't have the information available, we will connect them with someone who does. And what we can also do is support um, and break down the isolation of those live with NF because we can do that through our um, through the video or the webinars that we hold. We just started doing because of this pandemic and knowing the isolation is so difficult with the younger generations. We started some team game team game nights via Zoom. You know, we're trying to be as creative as we can to help support this isolation that has just really burdened the NF community. So the, and you know, it's important that we get the NF um, educational material out to these families to help them first get educated about what the illness and the disease that they're dealing with, but then also to help spread awareness and help educate their doctors and give them a path for the doctors to 
speak to other NF specialists to better provide the NF care that these individuals need. So we are very grateful and thank you for the opportunity to present and also for the donations that we have um, received. Awesome, thank you. And John, we started with you and so we're gonna let you wrap up this last question. Uh, tell us, what can we do? John, are you, you on mute? We can't hear you. No. <laughs> so we're gonna give him a second to get his speaker fixed. And in the meantime, like I said, we still have a few minutes left. So if you have any, Pamela, do we have any questions that have popped into the chat? Currently no questions, just as of yet. Okay. So hopefully John, try it. John, can you? Yeah, how about now? Oh, yeah. We can hear you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I'm the, who knows what happened, but you know, one of the things that about everything that we do in every organization here, what we realized is that even when COVID started, nothing, that didn't stop anything that we were still fighting for. I mean, kidney disease didn't stop when COVID started. So we had to be equally as relentless as this disease has been. And so we're asking for um, continued support uh, from the CFC community, uh, to help us continue to be there for those that depend on us, uh, especially now. Um, we have um, this note that 97% of all your donations goes directly to patients and programs. Um, and any amount that, that you can give is, uh, would be greatly appreciated. Um, I was a government employee for 15 years before I got into nonprofit. I remember signing the CFC card for $2 a pay period, $5 a pay period, or whatever. Every bit helps um, and could really benefit all of us here. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You know, we, we definitely appreciate, you know, your time. I know that everyone here has, you know, a, a mission with their charity, and we just want to thank you. I think I speak for everyone. We appreciate what you're doing on the front lines. We, you know, we hope for the best for each of you and your organizations, as well as you and your families. I know sometimes, <laughs> you know, you're so busy, you know, having to, to act and help others, but we hope too that you all are taking the time that you need to, to make sure that your cup is still full and that you're still, you know, having time for you and your families as well, you know, during this period. Um, everyone, we thank you for today for spending this time with us. We said the CFC, you know, it's a very impactful vehicle. Again, almost eight and a half billion dollars in the 60, almost 60 years that CFC has been, you know, um, active. And that is just from your generous federal dollars. And so we appreciate you. Please make sure that you share this information. This session has is being recorded. It's going to be put on our YouTube page. So share it with your coworkers. Talk about the information. I just want to do one quick last announcement of who we had. We want to thank you, Deb, from the Neurofibromatosis Network. Thank you, John O'Brien, from the American Kidney Fund. Thank you, Cynthia Osfeld from A Child's Wish. We thank you, Ruth. And Alan from the Ronald McDonald House Charities of Mississippi. And thank you, Darren. And I know we can't see Natalie, but we know she's still there with you. <laughs> Darren Thomas and Natalie Jones from Porter Leith. Again, we appreciate your time and everyone who has made time for this Lunch and Learn. We appreciate you as well. Our next Lunch and Learn is scheduled for December 2nd. We will be sending more information out about that Lunch and Learn. But the most important thing you can do is give. So we thank you, we appreciate you all, and we're giving you five minutes back of your time unless someone wants to toss a question into the chat real quick in this next 30 seconds before we sign off. Anyone? <laughs> um, the actual next session, I said December 2nd, it, it is actually December 3rd. Um, and so Paige, since you're plugging in information, type in our 
what's the topic for our next uh, our, our lunch and learn for the de December third as well, so we can announce that. It is animal welfare. Thank you. See, team, <laughs> animal welfare, everyone. We definitely, again, thank all of our panelists today. We thank you, everyone in the MS Delta who has spent this time with us. We appreciate you very much. Please go to givecfc.org and show some love today. We appreciate you and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 Um, thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for attending. Appreciate it. <laughs>